Amen. So it's good to be back again this evening. It was nice meeting all of you and getting to know some of you folks. And uh, again, just real thankful for the opportunity to be here and to preach to you. And I uh, look forward to hopefully getting to come back and, and do it again and see this church grow and continue on to in serving Christ and doing great things. But uh, let's just get right into the sermon uh, this evening. And I, I do want, you know, just full disclosure, I want to say that I, I preached this sermon that I'm going to preach to you tonight uh, recently, even to our folks in Tucson. And I kind of went back and forth because I never want to be, you know, uh, I don't want to, I don't feel like I'm serving up, you know, spiritual leftovers here or anything like that. And I, and I was real hesitant to to preach this. I thought maybe I should have something else that I haven't preached elsewhere. But just in the light of everything that's kind of gone on the last couple of weeks and really even over, you know, years, uh, re but recently some things came to light um, in some other churches and, and things like that. That I just felt like this is such an important message for the day that we're living in. And it's not a pleasant one. It's not one that I enjoy preaching. It's not a topic that's a pleasant topic to think about. But, you know, the Bible says that we're living in perilous times. The Bible says that uh, as we approach the end, that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And God's people need to be vigilant and God's people need to, uh, you, know, you know, they need to uh, understand the times that they're living in. And unfortunately, we're living in a time uh, where we're surrounded by, quite frankly, perverts. Yeah, right. We have perverts in, in places of power. We have perverts uh, roaming our streets and infiltrating our church houses. And I thought that this is just an appropriate message. And this, not this particular message, but the point of this sermon, the message of this sermon is a message that needs to just be preached in every pulpit across America. People need to wake up and understand uh, what's going on in our country today. And the title of the sermon is Perverted Judgment for Perverted People. Perverted Judgment for Perverted People. And I say, where do you get that out of Galatians chapter 1? Well, you look there in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him which called you into, a grace, uh, grace of Christ, uh, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So, we're on, obviously, I'm not talking about it in the context of this chapter, but that word there, pervert, what does that mean? We have to, we can look at the Bible and get a definition of that means, what that means. Now, of course, when we think of that word, we all have an understanding of what that means today. We apply it to specific individuals, and uh, we'll definitely, that definition applies and we'll play into the sermon. But to pervert something is to alter it. To pervert something is to alter something from its original course. To pervert something is to alter something from its original meaning or its, per, its original state. It's to distort something or corrupt something uh, from the way of which, or from what was first intended. Mm -hmm. So Paul here is using in the sense that, hey, there was this gospel of Christ. You know, it was true. It was pure. It was right. It was correct. Right. And then these people came along and they, and they perverted it. They, 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 they altered it. They, they uh, wanted to, to reach a different end by perverting the gospel. So this definition, the way it's used in this context, it's how we see it used quite often in Scripture. And if you would, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. It says, A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. People try to, uh, they want to change things, they want to alter things. And one way that they do it, it says here, is that they take some, they take a gift out of the bosom. What's that talking about? It's talking about a bribe. You know, we we would call that a bribe today. They take it out and they say, "Hey, lobbyist. You know, hey, senator. You know, they they pull out the briefcase and pop the lid open and say, "Hey, don't forget, you got a campaign coming up. You want to get reelected? Well, here's what our interests are." And that's what's going on. We're going to talk about that here at the first. But look here in Deuteronomy chapter 16. We'll see that you know God does not approve of that. That God looks down on that, that God takes it very seriously when the ways of judgment are being perverted in a land. He says in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God shall giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with, ju with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So we're talking, first of all, about the fact that we have perverted judgment in our land. And why is that? Because we have people that are supposed to be our judges, our officers, those that are in rule, uh, ruling over this country. They have been corrupted. They do not judge justly. Right. They have taken a gift. They respect persons. They rest judgment. And they pervert the words of the righteous. 
That's what's going on. So perverting judgment, you know, that's to rest judgments. It's to re respect persons. And there's several things that can lead to this. And one of them, as we just touched on, is the fact that they take a gift. They take a bribe. And I really don't want to focus in on that too much. And, and you know, we're all for having a voice in the government, you know, having people that can go and speak in our behalf. You know, lobbyists in and of themselves are not bad things to have. But unfortunately, the way our system works is the people that get hurt the most are the ones with the deepest pockets. Right, yeah. And if we don't have any money, you, you know, you, you mean squat on, up there on the hill. So, but some things, also other things besides just money, which we're not going to focus on, is, is uh, that lead to the perverting of judgment, such as taking a drive, are drunkenness. Now, I'm going to read to you from an article here in a minute, but our nation, and specific, specifically our capital, is filled with drunks. There is, an, there is a, a, and you'll hear me, you'll, I'm going to read this article and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute, that our, our government is just filled with drunkards. The people that are in the highest places of judgment in our land, they have been corrupted. Their judgment has been perverted by drink. The Bible says, and if you would turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4, it says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. And why is that? Lest they for drink and forget the law and do what? Pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And that's exactly what we see going on in places like Washington, D.C., any of our state capitals. There is a culture of drunkenness there. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 17, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, to take a widow's raiment to pledge. So God looks down and he says, when he sees a land perverting judgment, he is not pleased. I mean, this is something that God lays out in his law, that judgment is to be just, that judgment is to be righteous, that there should not be... Uh, a taking of bribes, that there should not be respecters, uh, respecting of persons. And he says here also, like I read to you in Proverbs, they should not be drinking. They should not be drunk. Otherwise, they forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And really, it, you know, that helps explain a lot of where we're at in our country. You know, when we look about as Christians and we, can, and we look at where uh, we are in this country, we compare the word of God, the righteous, holy statutes of the word of God, and then we see what our nation is actually about these days. It starts to make sense. It's hard to make sense that all the godless, unbiblical laws of our land can be attributed to these factors, that people are taking bribes and getting drunk, that they have corrupted the ways of judgment. And alcohol certainly is doing its part to help cloud the thinking and the perverting of judgment in, in those that are in these places of uh, leadership. <clears throat> I'll read to you real quick from this uh, other article, uh, rollcall.com where the drinkers are in Congress, it says, according to a survey of congressional staff, nearly half or 47% of staffers attend social events for work either once or twice a week. Those events are predominantly serving alcoholic beverages. Perhaps that lead to the data from the Center's Disease Control and Prevention showing that dist the District of Columbia, you know, Washington, D.C., with a slightly higher percentage of adult binge drinkers as compared to the natural national average of 16%. The national average of binge drinking is 16% across the nation. In alcohol, it's, it's quite a bit more. It's, a, it's slightly higher. Now, what is binge drinking? It's saying, you know, binge drinking is when a man drinks five drinks within two hours or a woman can drink uh, four drinks within two hours. And what this, basically, let me just summarize this, what this article says, and the facts here without, because if we start to read facts, they start to lose people. It says, Congressional staffers, right, they tie. So these people that are on staff, working for congressmen, working for representatives, people that are working in the halls of judgment in our land, that make laws, that pass laws, that enforce laws, they are, that's who they are, that's who they work for. They tie for second place and are led by only half a percent for first when it comes to binge drinking. They tie for second and first place is only half a percent ahead of them. And that's, I believe it was North Dakota. Now, North Dakota, I, I don't condone drinking at, at all. And I'm from South Dakota, so I can pick on North Dakota a little bit. All right, I was born there. There's nothing going on in North Dakota. At least it makes sense. You know, it makes a little bit more sense. They, you know, they're just, you know, they're just drinking their blues away or whatever it is up there. I mean, they're practically in Canada. No offense to anybody from Canada. I think I'm safe picking on Canada this far south, right? But, I mean, in Washington, D.C., second place, tied? Are you kidding me? Half a percent away from being in first for binge drinking? It's ridiculous. 
And you know, it gets worse. I mean, that sounds bad enough, but I have this article here and I'm going to read to you from, and please stay with me as I read from it. Uh, Washington's heavy drinking ways in spotlight from the Hill. This is not, you know, your fundamental publication here. This is not an independent Baptist, you know, this is the Hill. This is a very, uh, you know, worldly news source. And it says, Washington, D.C. has the highest rates of binge drinking and problem drinking in America. That's how the article starts out. It's a bruise, booze problem fueled by a uni uniquely stressful environment where many of the corporate uh, structures of accountability and oversight don't exist. From the executive branch to Capitol Hill, K Street lobbying firms to high-pressure newsrooms, free alcohol is easily accessible. What are they saying? That alcohol and drinking is part of the culture up there. It just, it just, it's part of the job. Going up there and going to these meetings with these corporations and staffers, you know, you walk in the office and some congressman and he's going to offer you a whiskey or whatever it is. It's just part of the culture. The days of the three martini lunch may be gone, but they have been replaced by hard partying nights filled with fundraisers, receptions, or long bar taps. And he, there's one here, this one particular story that's going to blow your mind that this kind of thing even goes on in, in a place where, where righteous judgment should be, where there should be uh, righteous laws being handed out. But what do we see instead? Perversion. We see a perversion of judgment. It says here, there is a, this is a quote, there is a strong push and a culture of intoxication in D.C. It's been like that for a long time, said Kevin Sabet, who served in White House, the White House offices of National Drug Control Policy in three different administrations. It's not a Republican or Democrat issue. It really cuts, cuts across all ideologies. This weekend, and this was written you know, around the, the, the holiday time of about a year ago, this weekend, Washington's political class will hobnob during at least 10 events surrounding the White House Correspondents' Dinners where drinks flow freely. The most common complaint at the dinner itself is that empty wine bottles are not replaced with sufficient speed. This is Washington. This is what's going on. During the holiday season, it is possible to spend weeks in a row drinking free while hopping from reception to reception sponsored by all manner of corrupt, uh, corruption. That's probably the right way to say it corporations and interest groups. So he's saying, look, when it gets around, that's what's going on. That's around the Christmas season right now. And there's people up there in Washington around, they're just going from one party to the next, one party to the next, drinking for free, drinking for free, you know, and, and, and uh, just being influenced by all these different corporations and interest groups. Being corrupted, allowing judgment to just be perverted, you know, allowing themselves to be bribed and, and, and bought with something even as simple and base as alcohol. Half a dozen current and former aides and members of Congress, all of whom asked for anonymity, I've never been able to say that word, to shed light on an unsavory side of the culture within the government. So these people, they say, hey, we'll tell you what it's like, but we've got to remain anonymous. Said a con these people said a combination of factors contribute to a heavy drinking environment. Members are away from their families for long stretches of time. Right. That's their excuse. Well, I'm away from my family. That's not an excuse. Then go home. Quit living like a drunk. Maybe the job's not worth it. If you can't take the, a job that's that serious and get and remain sober, and your excuse is, well, I'm just away from my family so much, well, then quit. You know, your family's more important. Right. And, and quit perverting judgment. I love how they just throw out there, well, you know, we're just away from our family so much. Lobbyists and supplicants are eager to please, whether via campaign contributions or a cocktail. So if they can't get you with the, the money, the contribution, they'll just give you some free liquor. I mean, that's... That's, a, that's pretty cheap, isn't it? Right. You can be influenced by here, have a free drink. What a joke. And a few former rules of governing workplace environment exist in the halls of Congress. Uh, uh, and few former rules governing workplace environment exist in the halls of Congress. So it's not like they have a lot of rules there to say, hey, you know, when you're on the clock for the U.S. government, you can't be tipping back. And they say, go right ahead. There's no oversight. There's no, nobody keeping these people in check. Virtually everyone who works in or around government has a story. And we're going to read about one here in a second. It's do as I say, not as I do, said one Republican from a um, former member of Congress. Now, now listen to this story. You, I'm going to read you this story, and you would think I was talking about a frat house. you think I was talking about some place on some college campus somewhere. But it's, this is the halls of judgment in our land. <laughs> Is where this is taking place because it's, been, it's perverted up there. One senior Senate, a senior Senate uh, aide, senior Senate aide, not a junior member, a guy who's been there a while, right? Recalled his early days on Capitol Hill when the member of Congress uh, for whom he was interning found a door off its hinges 
in the Longworth House office building. So he's going into uh, where he's interning, his place of work, up there in Washington, and he walks up, and the door's taken off the hinges. And he'd say, well, well what, why would you take the door off the hinges? Well, it goes on. The door became a table which the, which the member and his staff would play beer pong. That's what they did with the door in Washington. They took the door off and decided, well, let's play beer pong up here. Now, I mean, that just shows you how shameless they are, that they took the door off. Because now anybody can just walk in and catch you playing beer, and the, playing beer pong. That just shows me that it's just common practice that they just people would probably laugh. Yeah. Oh, where's your door? Oh, you're playing beer pong. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, our jud judgment in the land is just getting perverted. Right. Yeah. And we'll see the effects of that, per that perversion here in a minute. <clears throat> I'm just trying to get us to understand the source of the perversion in our country. That's what we're starting out doing right now. Why do we have so many, you know, literal perverts running around in all, you know, in, in churches, on the street, you know, and terrible things are happening to people, to children. Why is that happening? Because they're too busy playing beer pong up there. Right, right. Because they're too Amen. busy getting drunk and getting liquored up, and their judgment is perverted. <clears throat> and he says they began, uh, the door became a table on which the, this member and his, of, and his staff would play beer pong positioned over a conference room table so as not to leave stains on the more permanent furniture. Well, we wouldn't want, you know, we wouldn't want to stain the furniture, you know. That we, you know, no, never mind staining America's moral fabric, but we'll go. Let's just protect the furniture. Uh, <clears throat> the tournaments began before noon on Fridays and lasted often until midnight. Excessive drinking among America's political leaders is as old as the Republic itself, and it goes through Washington, Truman, so on and so forth. And it says here in more recent years, ex-representative Mark Foley from Florida admitted to being drunk when he sent inappropriate text messages to underage pages. So his, perver his, his judgment is perverted, and he himself is a pervert. And it's all thanks to drink. And, you know, you, you think you'd be talking about some guy, you know, living under an overpass or some guy, you know, hanging out in some dingy bar in some seedy part of town. No, this is a representative from Florida, from Florida up in, you know, Washington that's doing this stuff. Today's Washington, uh, Washingtonians purchase more alcohol on a per capita basis than any state except New Hampshire, according to the Centers for Disease Control. Nearly a quarter of the district residents are binge drinkers, defined assuming more than five drinks in an evening. That is the second highest rate in the nation behind North Dakota. See, I was right. And Washington bears higher economic costs of problem drinking than any other state. Alcohol problematic drinking is having a more of an economic devastating effect on our nation's capital than any other state in our country. <clears throat> a, part, a part of the higher rates comes from the high stakes nature of government jobs. Well, I will admit that it is a high stakes nature, isn't it? When you're passing laws, when you're, when you're the one up there that's going to decree the law of the land, you bet it's high stakes. You bet it's going to affect people's lives. Millions of people will be affected by what goes on up there. So, it's, but they want to make that sound like, well, because it's such an important job, we should just get drunk. We have to deal with the stress. It's the complete opposite, Fred. The Bible says that you should have clear thinking. You should be sober. Why? So that you don't pervert uh, judgment in the land. So that you can wise, uh, wisely judge. You can have righteous judgment. They've got it completely backwards. <clears throat> we know that high power jobs, high income, and that is a risk factor for excessive drinking. You have a lot of people in powerful, high-paying jobs downtown. People with money and stressful jobs tend to drink more. And you know what else they tend to do? They tend to pervert judgment in the land. That's what they end up doing. And you say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, let's, you know, let's look at, let's consider some of the, where we're at in this country when it comes to this topic of perverts. <clears throat> Go over to Jude chapter 1. So we see, first of all, that one form of perversion is when judgment is being perverted in the land. When people are not judging righteously, when they're judging corruptly, when they're resting judgment, when they're uh, decreeing wicked laws, when they're clearing uh, the guilty and condemning the innocent, judgment has been perverted. That's one sense of, of, of perversion. Another uh, sense of perversion, and I'm trying to keep this as, as uh, look, I don't want any parents to have to leave here and explain the birds and the bees to their kids on the way home, okay? 
So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use uh, some, some other words to describe this. Not that I'm replacing words that are derogatory, okay? But the other definition of pervert or perversion would be a person whose venereal behavior, I think we all know that. If you don't know what that is, you probably don't need to know. His venereal behavior is regarded as abnormal and unacceptable, right? That we would say that person is a pervert. You know, that, then that could encompass a whole list of things. And what does this look like in Scripture? Can we see an example of that? Well, yes, we can. There in Jude chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal gentle, uh, excuse me the vengeance of eternal fire. So a pervert is somebody that would go after strange flesh, right? Because a pervert is somebody whose behavior in that regard is abnormal. It's unacceptable. They desire strange flesh. When someone's desiring something strange, you say that's that's weird. Another word for me would be queer, right? That's a perfect word for it. Because all queer means is bent beyond repair. It means you're not straight. You take something and you bend it, you've made it queer. And you can't get it back to being straight again. That's where those terms come from, queer and straight. It's being bent. It's being queer. It's being uh, abnormal. It's being unacceptable. It's being a pervert is what we would call it. It's being uh, somebody that would go after strange flesh. Strange flesh meaning flesh which is uncommon or unnatural. Another word would be there in Romans chapter 1 if you want to turn there real quick. <clears throat> we'll see another way you can uh, uh, define this. Define this behavior. You know, somebody who would go after strange flesh, you know, would go, somebody who would go after something that's unnatural or uncommon. Romans 1, 26, I'll begin verse, uh, there, uh, verse 26, I'll begin reading. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lusts one toward another, men with men, working with that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to what? A reprobate mind to do what? Those things which are not convenient, things that are strange, things that are unnatural, things that are uncommon, things that are abnormal and unacceptable, things that are perverted. You're describing perverts here. So perverts are people who have been given over to a mind that desires strange flesh, flesh that is not convenient, flesh that is, nor that is not normal to human desire. It's not just you know, your, your, your common everyday fornicator. It's somebody who has a strange perversion that desires things that normal people would not. Now, if you would, turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. So we see, first of all, that pervert can describe a person with abnormal physical desires. Right? It can also refer to a person or refer to, a, uh, refer to possessing or influencing a corrupted sense of judgment. You know, those people up there who are playing beer pong that are, you know, <clears throat> senators and representatives and their staff that are playing beer pong and who knows what else, you know, their judgment, are they're perverts in the sense, you know, at least that their, their thinking is perverted. And many of them are perverted in the other sense as well. <clears throat> so, look at it and you say, well, what does this matter to us? Well, <clears throat> here's the problem with being, having perverted people in judgment is that it leads to more perverts of the other kind. It leads to more perverts uh, in, our, in our society. Perversion and, uh, perversion and judgment leads to perversion in behavior. Or another way of saying that is a perverse government and a perverse people go hand in hand. When you have a perverse government, it, it should not surprise you when you say perverts flourishing in that land and being protected. Look there at Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. This is, this is something, every time I read some horrific news article about some terrible thing happening to a, a child or a, a, anybody, really, especially when it's of a venereal nature, when it's carnal in nature, is I think of this verse. It says in verse 11, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the son of, sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. What's the Bible saying? It's, it's telling us that when righteous judgment is slow, or even worse, absent, when it's slow or absent, perverse men become emboldened to act on their desires. That's when the perverts say, hey, there's no consequences. Or the consequences are something that I can live with. 
and they and then the things that they might not otherwise do because of the consequences now they're emboldened to do them and they say hey what's the worst that could happen you might go to jail for for a few years i might end up on a list somewhere you know i might have to i might i might not be able to get a good job but you know so what i got to fulfill this wicked lust that's in my heart <clears throat> so perverts you know the problem is that having perverts in a, in a perverted judgment in the land is the fact that perverts that they rule over are emboldened to do wicked things you know the perverts in society they see these light sentences that are handed out in our society and they are they hand, and we'll talk about that here in a minute they see these light sentences that are handed out they see what short prison terms or prison terms that are cut short and people are let out early for good behavior they see all that. They see that they see the the child molester going to prison and then get putting in segregation with the other child molesters, protected. <clears throat> and they and they think, well, you know what? The risk is worth the reward. I'll risk going getting this light sentence. I'll risk spending a few years in segregation. I'll risk, you know, they might even risk 25 years. So you can get that. Now I don't think it happens all the time, but you can get it. They'll risk that. If, you know, because because it's worth it to them. Now, we can't understand that as normal people. We can't even understand that desire. It's strange to us. And, and But people need to understand something. That's where we're at in this country. We have perverted judgment in our land, handing out pe you know, per people whose, whose minds have been corrupted through alcohol and bribery and, and the philosophies of the world. that they, don't, they, they think the Bible is just some Stone Age book that we're just a bunch of... Uh, you know, knuckle dragging Neanderthals, and that they've got it all figured out up there. But look at the society they're making. Look what's going on on their under their watch. That's right. Perverts. They're just roaming free and just acting out on every wicked, vile, disgusting uh, impulse that they have. Marching up and down the streets. These at these these fag pride parades. It's disgusting. That's where we are. And people and 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 people just are are fine with it. <laughs> So again, these perverts, they see these light sentences, they see these short prison terms, and they say it's worth it. They say, you know what, evil or, or, or judgment, a sentence is not being carried out at all. If at all, it's not being done speedily, and therefore my heart is set to do evil. And that's what they do. Now, a perfect example of this is Jared Vogel. Who remembers Jared Vogel? See, you've already forgotten. You know, I'm going to tell you who it is, and you'll remember the subway guy. Remember, remember Subway Jared? Who remembers Subway Jared? Yeah, everybody in the room. That's right. Subway Jared. Remember what he ended up doing? You know, I don't want to go into the illicit and the debauchery that that man got involved with for the sake of everyone's, you know, ears. But he was into underage girls and he was soliciting them. He was uh, employing other underage girls to go and solicit them for him. He was distributing child pornography, this guy, and he got busted. And you know what? They, they made, they were going to make an example out of this guy. Well, he went to prison, he got beat up, and then you know what happened? He got put in segregation. And there was an article, I won't read the article, but I'll give you the gist of it. This guy had known Jared Vogel in this, this wing of the prison or whatever he was in. And he came out and said, hey, you know what? Jared Vogel's living the high life in prison. Jared Vogel's doing all right. I want to tell you what's going on with Jared Vogel. And Jared Vogel's not fearing for his life. Jared Vogel's not living with the scars of what he did, uh, you know, ruining his life. The people that he hurt, you know, who knows what, who knows what they're still going through. Uh, <laughs> but Jared Vogel, he's living the high life. That's what the guy said in prison. He's in a dry cell. Now, what is a dry cell? It means it's an open door. You can come and go out of your cell as you please. You can come and go as you please. And he's in there with other chomos, which chomo is the prison term for child molester. That's what they call him. He's in there. What else is he doing? He's playing online poker. That's what this guy says. He's in there. He's gambling. He's watching movies. They have movie nights. He's getting his culinary arts degree. The man has got a degree in culinary arts. A child uh, rapist, a, a violator of children. In our land that that's what got handed out to him so now there's some other pervert out there that looks at jared vogel and goes, well, that's not so bad maybe, maybe i'll go do what he did and that's what the bible's warning us of there in ecclesiastes 
when we do not execute uh, justice and, and judgment and sentence speedily, the hearts of men are set in them to fully to do evil. And Jared Vogel is a perfect exam example of that. You say, I don't know, I think you're blowing us out of proportion. Okay, do, you know, then go home tonight and Google like prison sentence child rapist and, wa and just read them. Or just rapist. And go read just the story after story after story after story in our country. And not just, not just people that you would, that wouldn't surprise you. I'm talking, I mean, sheriffs <laughs> getting busted doing this, cops, everybody. Judges, it's corrupt. And why is it? Because we have perversion in, our, in the judgment in our land. The, the, the people that should be executing uh, righteous judgment speedily upon these wicked people are drunk. And they're bought. And they have no discernment. And now people like these Jared Fogles come up and uh, they're just living the high life. <clears throat> Did you know in the United States it is illegal to execute pedophiles for their crimes? With one exception. I mean, I, again, I, I don't want to frighten any of the kids. I don't want to, you know, but this is where we're at in this country. This is where we are today. And, this, and, this, and we need to understand this. And you say, well, what's the application? We need to protect our children. That's right. Right. Because these people are emboldened. That they're, they're coming into our church houses. They're getting up behind the pulpits. They're taking positions of power. You know, and, and they're creeping in. You know, and that's why I'm, that's why I'm glad I'm in another church that doesn't have a nursery, that doesn't have a children's ministry. I'm glad for that. Yes. You know, and, and, if it, and that's a whole other, and I'm not saying everybody that works in a nursery is one of these people, but do you really want to leave your children open to that? I mean, it, hap it can happen so fast and so quick, and it's, it's, once it's done, it's done. Once that happens to a child, that's it. They're changed forever. Their innocence is gone, and it's, it's a sad, sad thing. And what they do, again, not getting the details, I think we all understand how horrific it can be in some of these cases, in many of these cases. That the scars that these children have to live with, the things that they have to overcome, if they themselves don't, it's a lot of often it becomes a vicious cycle where they themselves lash out later in life and do the same things to another person. <clears throat> and you say, well, if anybody deserves to die, it's somebody that would violate a child. If there's one person I would love to just throw a rope over the old oak tree in the town square and string up on a Sunday afternoon, it's a, it's a pedophile. <clears throat> and, but those days are gone. In fact, it's illegal to do it. And I'm not, you know, let me, get out, let me break out the legalese for you here from our, our U.S. Code 18, Crimes of Criminal Behavior, Part 1, Chapter 110, Exploitation and Other Abuse of Children, Section 2251. You know, you got to be a lawyer to have to understand half of it. That's why I love God's Word. You can just turn to a page, you know, their blood shall be upon them. <laughs> Pretty cut and dry. You know, stone them with stones. Done. You know, one chapter, you know, one book, one chapter, one verse. Done. Not this. This is just a small section. <clears throat> Any individual who violates or attempts to or conspires to violate this section shall be fined under this title and in prison not less than 15 years nor more than 30 years. But if such person, and it just goes on and on and on. And basically, what you're looking at for your first violation, if you're a child, uh, if you're distributing pornography, if you're uh, doing, if you're trafficking, if you're abusing, if you uh, have aggravated assault, on, and this is all related to children, uh, you shall be imprisoned for not less than 25 years, nor more than 50. But it's a lot of cases they, they get off. There's a lot of light sentences that get handed. A lot of times they say, there's states now that say, well, let's, you know, it's, it's, the person just needs to be rehabilitated. We just need to put them in a program and let them back out into society. You can't fix these people. They're reprobates. <laughs> you know, you say, well, that's, that's, you know, that's not, at least it's something. Well, what happens if they do it a second time? Not less than 35 years, no more than life. And they say, well, you know, they'll go in there maybe for 35 years. Maybe they'll serve five to 10 of that. And, you know, and, and uh, maybe they'll, they'll get out, but then they'll be on a background check, right? Well, it's too late for the kid that they already hurt. It's too late for that one. That's why background checks don't work. Now, the, that's why I'm in favor of underground checks. It's about six feet under. That's my kind of a background check. Because you don't have to wonder what he's up to. He's, he's still there. He hasn't gotten anybody. He's still six feet under, and that's where he's going to stay. 
So again, first conviction, 15 to 30 years. Second conviction, uh, 25 to 30. Now, the only way a child molester can get the death penalty in this country, in states that even have the death penalty, is if they kill the victim. They have to kill the victim to get it. And that just shows you that how what they they just how uh, low regard they have for life in this country anymore. That happens to a child. That that part of that child has died. That they might as well be in a sense dead. Now I got I know God's grace is there. And people can heal and can people can go through that and move on in their life and can recover. The victims can, but uh, sometimes they don't. And it doesn't change the fact that that still happened to them, and that part of their childhood was robbed from them. But <laughs> And these people deserve to die, according to Scripture. And the only way they get it in this country is if they kill the child in the process. I mean, we're, what kind of country are we living in anymore? What's happened in this country? You know, it, it's like it's like living in a, it's a madhouse anymore. I mean, to sit there and to think, you know, that's justice. To think that's judgment, you'd see you'd have to be drunk to think that's justice. That's right. And that's exactly what's going on. A bunch of drunks think that's judgment. They think, oh, yeah, that sounds fair. We must be drunk. Oh, well, we are. Well, it makes sense. Now I can connect the dots. It's all coming together for me. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says, you know, to judge righteous judgment. That's what we're supposed to do as God's people. And that's what should be going on in this land. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 32. God wants us to justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. So what it says in Deuteronomy 25, you're going to Deuteronomy chapter 32. People say, you know, and then there's that the favorite the favorite verse, uh, liberal verse of all time, you know, John, uh, you know, it's not John, but it's uh, Matthew. You know, judge not, judge not, except you be judged. With what judgment? You, it goes, well, it goes on, friend. It doesn't end there. Judge not, except you be judged. It's not it's talking about not being a hypocrite in judgment. It's not saying don't ever judge. They love that verse, but let's turn them over to John 7. Judge not according to the parents, but judge righteous judgment. You know, don't don't look at them and go, oh, well, they that poor child molester, they just had, you know, they had a, a, a rough upbringing themselves. And, you know, they're they can, you know, they can be rehabilitated and put back in society and, and still serve a purpose. You're judging according to the appearance. And that points you're not judging righteous judgment. The crime has been done, and the judgment must be doled out, and, and, and justice must be served. And now let me say this, because we always have to clarify these kind of sermons, right? Because that's what everyone wants to get in the comment section. You're, you're trying to raise an army, you know? You're advocating violence. No, I'm not. Did I tell any of you to go out today and, and, and to, to take things into your own hands? No, I haven't said that. And let me go a step further and say this, being murdered in jail is not righteous judgment. And that's what happens to a lot of these, these chomos when they go in there. Because when you go in as a chomo, you're the lowest tier person. You are a marked man in prison. You know, it takes somebody in prison who in all likelihood should probably either not be there or be dead themselves, you know, murderers, to figure out what should happen to these people. Because our leaders are too drunk to figure it out for themselves. We have to have to let the lowest dregs of society execute judgment upon these people. And I'm not advocating it. And, but what that is, what that shows us, is what a sham our legal system is. That's right. It's a shame to our society when judgment, the proper judgment has to be carried out by somebody else who's locked up. And I'm not advocating it, and I don't think it's, it's something that should be done. I'm just pointing it out because of the fact that it's a shame. It just shows you where we're at. And let me say this, this sermon is not to call for a vigilante justice. I'm not saying that at all. I've been saying the whole time, the problem is, is that the people that should be executing judgment upon these people are drunk and corrupt and perverted in their thinking. <clears throat> this sermon is pointing out the perversion of justice by the proper authorities and the perversion it breeds in society. That's what the sermon is about. It's not a call to arms. Let me say this, striking a plea, de plea deal with a guilty predator is not justice. Amen. Striking a plea deal with a guilty predator is not justice. You say, well, the victim's happy for it. Good. If the, if the victim feels like they got justice, fine. Good for them. But according to Scripture, that's not justice. 
I mean, it's something. It's better than nothing. At least you have an admission of guilt. But then you have these guys that are going to spend 90 days in jail because they struck a plea bargain. People that took advantage of impressionable underage girls and exploited them. And, who, and, and all other manner of things that go on with these perverts. They get off. They get easy. They get a light sentence. You know, a, you know what inspired this one was that, that guy, Cameron Giovanelli, who knows who I'm talking about? He was all over Facebook and everything else. He was, you know, getting called out by another pastor for over a year for the things that he did as a pastor of a church, you know, violating a young girl in his congregation on a, almost a daily basis at the church building for over a year. And he gets caught, he gets busted, and he goes to jail, or he goes to, to trial, strikes a plea deal. And the guy's uh, getting a light, he's getting a slap on the hand. Wow. And you know what? If the, if the victim's fine with it, you know, good for them. I'm glad that they feel like they've got some justice. But I'm not going to sit back and call that justice. And, and because now there's some other guy who says, oh, all you got to do is plead guilty? Hmm. Well, let me put on a suit. Let me go to Bible college. Let me get a, a church somewhere. Let me use my position authority and I'll do the same thing. Because what's the worst that can happen? If I get caught at all, you know, I, if they, you know, a lot of times, all well, that'll happen to me is I'll just get shuffled around from one church to another. That's what happened to this Cameron Giovanelli. You got, you know, you just they shuffle them around. Oh, come here! And it happens all the time with the, with these with these perverts. It's like the Catholic Church now with independent Baptists, and it's a shame. And now there's, you know, the world's taking notice, and they're writing whole articles, and it's a reproach to the name of Christ that these perverts can walk into churches and get in these positions of power. And instead of getting called out, and instead of getting uh, you know, called on the carpet and handed over the proper authorities, they get moved around. They get covered up. get swept under the rug. <clears throat> it's wicked as hell. <clears throat> and that's what happened to this guy. And he gets caught, and then he gets a little, that's enough. Don't do that again. Yes, sir. You would say, well, what is, what is the, the biblical punishment for these people? Death. Bible says in Luke 17, and this is the words of Jesus Christ, then said he unto his disciples, it is impossible that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea that he should be, that he should offend one of these little ones. Amen. He's saying, you know what? You should tie a millstone around your neck and cast in the sea. You know what I, I heard recently and I never even noticed it? Is it says that if you were to take one of these perverts, and tie a neck or tie a millstone around their neck and cast them into the depth of the sea. It says it would be better. Yeah. It would be better. Mm -hmm. That would be the best that they could hope for. Because, you know, I'm kind of getting my head at myself a little bit here. Whatever, wherever man fails in judgment, God has is not going to. That's right. Right. <laughs> when God gets a hold of these people, it would be better that he just it would be better for Cameron Giovanelli if we could tie a, a, a millstone around his neck. And he could be cast in the depth of the seas, and he could just live there for eternity. And he could just somehow miraculously just live there in the dark, cold depths of the ocean with all kinds of sea creatures picking at him than to get what is actually going to come to him. And that would be better than when God gets a hold of him and what he's going to do to him in hell. <clears throat> it says in Exodus 21, He that stealeth a man and selleth him or if be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. That's your child trafficker. That's your human trafficker. Someone who would steal a man and exploit them, sell them. And that's a real problem that we have in this country. You know who that is? That's your uh, Jeffrey Epstein, or Epstein, or whatever, however you say it. And, you know, I appreciate the cleverness of the memes has anyone seen the Epstein memes? You know, Epstein didn't hang himself. It's all over Facebook. You think you're reading, you know, a coffee house menu, you know, espresso, latte, Epstein didn't hang himself. You know what I'm saying? They, they sneak it in here, there. You know, the, it, it's this clever thing to try and remind everybody that he didn't hang himself. You know, and, and, and for, you know, it's clever, but here, let me just say this. You know, Epstein might not have hung himself, and, and, and maybe uh, he did. I don't know. But either way, I'm glad he's dead. Amen. That's right. 
Does, I wonder sometimes the people that are making these beams have actually looked into who that guy was and what he was involved with and the level of perversion. I would tell you to go look at it, but I already have, and I'm, it, it's filthy, and I would not suggest it. Don't go watch the 60 Minutes report on he Henry Epstein, or Henry, Jeffrey Epstein. Sorry, Henry, whoever you are, you're out there. <laughs> you know, it's wicked. That guy was a filthy pervert, and he violated thousands of underage girls. The man is wicked as hell. So I don't want to even, you know, and I know people aren't doing that with those memes and things like that, but let's not make a martyr out of the man. I'm glad that dude's dead. You know, I, I hope he hung himself. I hope he did do it himself. He say, but we could have caught, you know, the elites that he was providing these underage girls to. You know, the Bible says it is shame to even speak of those things which are done to them in secret. And they're going to get theirs one day anyway. That's right. And he probably didn't hang himself. You know what? I kind of hope he did. Because that would show you the man at least had one sliver of shame for what he did. But he probably just did it because he knew his life of debauchery was over. <clears throat> you know, I have no desire to hear. I, I'm glad he's dead because I don't. I don't want to see that drug out in the media. I don't have no idea, desire to hear the sordid details of right. everything he was involved in. It's bad enough, you know. Prince Andrew that was involved with him in the so-called royal family is, is is caught up in it now. I'm sure we'll have to continue to hear about it. Another good reason to just throw out the TV so we don't have to hear about this garbage. Because <clears throat> here's the thing: he said, "Well, we could have caught the other people that were involved." They got it coming. It were better for them that they tied a millstone around the neck and jumped to the sea. The Bible says, and if you're there in Deuteronomy chapter 32, look at verse 32. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. I mean, you just read this, and the Bible is just so true today. It's just, it just, it's so applicable today. It's like you could be describing Washington right now. Their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed among my, up among my treasures? What's God saying? He's like, I know it, and I'm keeping track, and I know exactly what's going on. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them shall make haste. They're not getting away with it. They might end up in segregation somewhere and they might be like little Mr. Vogel and playing their online poker and getting their culinary arts degree. But God says, I've sealed it up in my treasures and the day of his calamity is at hand. Right. And we need to console ourselves in, in that fact. We need to counsel ourselves in that fact. Because I don't know about you, when I hear about this stuff going on in our country, it vexes me. It bothers me. It makes me afraid for my children. It makes me afraid for other children. To hear about these perverts even slipping into independent fundamental Baptist churches, getting on, on bus routes. I could tell you stories that I've heard and, and others have, have witnessed. It vexes me, and you say, Is there no justice? And then you read these stories where they just they get their little slap on the wrist and they're back out and they do it again. You know, I wish I could have found the article. And I, I read one about a sheriff where it was a four year old girl repeatedly got five years. Five years for what he did to some child. And you say, God, is there no justice? God says, I, I know. And when God gets his hands on him, he's going to wish he was in the bottom of a sea with a millstone around his neck. If you would, turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Well, what's the point of the sermon? Well, to help us understand that we're living in a country, in a world even, that presumes to know better than God. They think they've got it all figured out, that their way is better. And what's the result? We're all worse off for it. We're the ones that have to deal with it. We're the ones that have to be vexed and put up with it. And God forbid that we ever have to be the ones to experience any of these terrible things. <clears throat> so let's counsel ourselves in the fact that knowing that God is going to take judgment on these people. It says there in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14, I know that whatsoever God doeth it, it shall be forever. Whatever he does. That includes... <laughs> sending these people to the lowest hell. It's going to be forever. <clears throat> you say, well, man, I, I don't know, Corbin. You, you sound like you're, you're taking a little too much pleasure in that. Well, you know what? Let them go down quickly into the pit. 
Let death seize upon them. Let them go down quickly into hell. That's the same prayer as the psalmist. <clears throat> God says, nothing can be put to it nor anything uh, taken from it. God doeth it that men should fear before him. We should learn, the people need to learn to fear God. We talked about this this morning. That which hath been is now, uh, which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. You know, the, 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 the wicked, filthy things that, that people are, the, the, the wickedness and the powers and the principalities and high places and the things that they do, they've been, it's been going on forever. I mean, they've been doing this type of thing all the way back to Molech when they were burning him in the fire and everything else. And now there's nothing new with God. And God judged them, and God will continue to judge. And he said in verse 16, And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment that wickedness was there. <clears throat> that Washington was there. Oh, I mean wickedness. Right? <clears throat> and the place of righteousness that iniquity was there. And I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time, uh, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. God hasn't forgotten; justice will be served, and and and, and you know, <laughs> payday's coming for these people, even if man doesn't get it right. And I wish man did, because of the fact that if he did, if God, if they did judge righteously, we would probably see less of it, or at least they'd be afraid to act out. <clears throat> Say, well, I don't know. It, 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 does God really want to do all these? Does He really still like this? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, God hasn't changed. He said, uh, "Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, great, and because their sin is grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done to, uh, altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know." God's going to get to the bottom of it of every wicked, filthy perversion that's out there. And he's going to judge the guilty. <clears throat> so, you know, who knows better? Jesus, God, or some drunk liberal judge in Washington? Who's got, who's got the righteous judgment tonight? Our political leaders or the Word of God? You know, I'm going to side with the Word of God. Amen. Because our leaders, they've erred. They've perverted judgment through strong drink and wine. <clears throat> There's no righteous uh, judgment of, for perverts in our land because of the perverts we got in high places. And, you know, it's a word of warning to you tonight. It's a word of warning to watch your children vigilantly. Don't leave them. I, I don't leave my kids with people in church. I don't, I don't suspect anyone in my church as being a pervert. But you know what? We've had them. And they've got run out on a rail. You know what we didn't do? Cover it up. They got called out and turned over to the authorities when we found out. But they were in that church for over a year before we found out. <coughs> Guard your children. You know, uh, Pastor Anderson's got it right with his, with his uh, I believe, you know, for me, in my house, he's got it right. You know, trust, uh, suspect no one, trust no one. You know, you just guard your children because, it, I mean, it's, it's going on. And these people are out there because there's no righteous judgment. So it's a word of warning tonight to watch your children, to protect your children. Don't leave them with, with strangers. Don't leave them with people that you don't know. And, 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 uh, and you know, you need to do with that what you will. And it's also, you know, believe it or not, it's supposed to be an encouragement, <laughs> this sermon. I'm trying to encourage you because I'm sure a lot of this isn't news to, to many of us. I'm sure a lot of us have felt the same way I feel about it. Vexed. I'm wondering, where's, where's judgment? Where's the righteous judgment? Why are these people getting away with it? They're only getting away with it for now. Ultimately, in the long run, they're not. <laughs> and really, our only solace as this society continues to decay, and it's, it's going to get worse. You know, let's just, again, I'm trying to be an encouragement, but let's be a little bit realistic. The Bible says that it's going to wax worse and worse. Not the love of many shall grow cold. And as this society continues to decay, we can solace ourselves in the fact that we understand that God one day is going to execute a punishment upon these people far more severe than man ever could. I mean, when you think about it, executing these people quickly is almost, it's merciful on, from man's perspective. 
Like, why does God, I mean, isn't it, isn't it more of a punishment to lock these people up? No, because you're sparing them from God's judgment. The real punishment is after they die. When God gets a hold of them. And God will get a hold of them. So let's just solace ourselves in that fact, fact and let's protect our children in the meantime. Let's go ahead and pray.